we'll explain how they all fit together. Are we ready to go? Can we just have to be available as well? Yeah, yeah. Let's go in the video as well. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm starting with the pyrolysis uh, and, and biochar unit. Uh, and so quotes I'd like to give from the literature, global analysis revealed that up to 12% of total anthropogenic carbon emissions by land use change can be offset annually in soil slash inverters replaced by slash and char. So in other words, uh, rather than burning off the crop waste, instead you put them in the char machine and make get this gasoline and oil and other products out of them. Um, agricultural and forestry waste, is, such as forest residues, mill residue, field crop residue, or urban waste, add a conservatively estimated 0.16 gigaton carbon per year. Um, using published projections of the use of renewable fuels in the year 2100, the biochar sequestration could amount to 5.5 to 9.5 gigatons of carbon per year if this demand for energy was met through pyrolysis, which would exceed current emissions from fossil fuels, 5.4 gigaton carbon per year. In other words, if we convert, we wind up sequestering more carbon than would be emitted by the current use of fossil fuels. Um, at the same time, new emissions from fossil fuels would be phased out as fuel and energy from this net carbon negative system replaces it. There does not to, uh, appear to be any upper limit to stabilized carbon stored in this manner and has a residence time range of from 1300 to 2300 years. Scroll up. By the nature of the pyrolysis process, heat energy is generated as well as gas and so can be used to run power generation, steam turbines, and finally hot water as byproducts. In a locally distributed system, rather than a centralized industrial model, uh, this could provide much of the electricity needs as well as the replacement of liquid fossil fuel needs of most communities in temperate and moist tropical climates and resulting long, in long-term sequestration of carbon while at the same time enhancing pro crop productivity, especially in depleted or oxidized soils. And here are some, some quick uh, comparison pictures I wanted to put up here. Here's our standard where your, your plant biomass is returning and, re and releasing most of the carbon back into the uh, uh, atmosphere. So carbon accumulation in this manner or a natural manner is a very slow process. Can we take a look at the second one, please? Here, by means of pyrolysis, we're diverting off the energy uh, and, and then 50% uh, of the waste is left as biochar in the soil, uh, which is again a stabilized carbon rather than an organically available carbon which is going to break down and turn into carbon dioxide. So in, in this way we divert uh, the energy off and are able to capture this energy rather than having it simply return to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide before returning it half of that carbon to the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Can you get it on, please? And it says, uh, yeah, that's good. Have I gone too far? No, that's okay. Um, I'll just skip those. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, okay, so the second figure illustrates a manipulated carbon cycle due to biochar carbon sequestration. Biochar is recalcitrant against decomposition and remains in the soil for centuries or millennia, thus pyrolysis can transfer 50% of the carbon stored in plant tissue from the, uh, from the active to an inactive carbon pool. The remaining 50% of carbon can be used to produce energy and fuels. This enables carbon negative energy generation if regrowing resources are used. In other words, uh, with each unit, uh, if energy uh, produced CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. So in other words, you're removing as much carbon from the atmosphere for long-term sequestration as you, are, as you are burning back into the atmosphere as a liquid fuel or equivalent of gasoline or diesel. Uh, biochar reduces the need for fertilizer resulting in reduced emissions from fertilizer production. Biochar increases soil microbial life resulting in more carbon storage in soil. Because biochar retains nitrogen, emissions of nitrous oxide, a, a, a potent greenhouse gas, may also be reduced. Turning agricultural waste into biochar reduces methane, another uh, potent greenhouse gas generated by the natural decomposition of the waste. And those are my sources for that. Okay, so that's the brief on biochar. And so we would like to know then where are we going to get all of this plant uh, material uh, to, as our feedstock for our biochar process. And as you saw from the introductory videos, uh, that uh, this is really a fairly low-tech process. It can often be made out of scavenged uh, uh, post-industrial waste. 
and uh, which, which I'll say agroforestry and agropastoralism. Now, agro, what agroforestry is in short is that you're taking between one and two of every section of crop. I'm sure you've seen how they have these wide tractor rows of wheat fields, etc. Well, basically, you, you use lines of trees interspersed into your crop fields, um, which doesn't reduce the, uh, which doesn't reduce the uh, uh, effective crop output very much, uh, and, and go and, but has numerous other benefits, which I'll go into now. Um, now, you can imagine trees on contour, right? Lines of trees on contour separating just as contour farming is recommended today for soil retention, etc. except that you also have these lines of trees, maybe one to three for crop production area. Um, and this results in uh, a whole bunch of different things happening. One is a moderation of climatic extremes, uh, which reduces crop loss, uh, and it reduces extreme weather events, reduced water discharge rates because the trees are holding back uh, the water and which results in reduced flooding. Uh, it, it also results in increased soil, water, and aquifer recharge and retention. So uh, it, assuming that you have uh, aquifer recharge trenches dug along your lines of trees, that this increases the infiltration rate as well as de decreasing the discharge rate. Um, and what this results in overall is reduced drought effects. Uh, and uh, by means of transpiration of the trees, uh, them exhaling water. Now, uh, you can imagine the surface area of the pores of the leaves of a tree compared to a flat piece of water and the resulting possible surface area uh, uh, which results that the tree is able to exhale a lot more water than simple evaporation. Uh, many times, in fact, and and for this reason, and also you have the uh, the uh, condensation nuclei, which are the result of the dust coming off of the trees themselves, which results in higher rates of rainfall in arid areas. Uh, it also results in, uh, uh, for those concerned about their animals, um, cows and sheep and such, it results in increased animal stock survival because they are protected and so uh, a, a lot higher of a of yield is able to be gained because more, uh, fewer animals are lost and has also shown to result in an uh, up to 20% increase in weight gain. So this would be a very good way to convince uh, 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 ranchers, in this case, to grow lots more trees. It will directly affect their bottom line in terms of profit. Um, and also re results in reduced surface wind speeds, which again moderates uh, uh, extreme climatic events. Um, and because they're trees, you have a greatly increased carbon uptake compared to standard row cropping. Uh, of grains or vegetables or what have you. So you have a, a drastically increased carbon uptake and storage. And also if you use nitrogen fixing trees, this replenishes the nitrogen and reestablishes a natural uh, uh, biologically based nitrogen fixation process, which re again reduces the need for petroleum based nitrogen fertilizer inputs. And it also prevent, it has a tendency to prevent farm failure because you have a diversification of income and products. And it also relieves uh, fuel pressure for wood fuel. And this is particularly important in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, other uh, tropical areas. Uh, it, it relieves pressure on existing forests uh, in terms of fuel. So people having fuel directly available have a tendency to cut a lot less fuel because they don't have to go as far to get it. Um, and it also results in a dramatic increase in food security uh, and sovereignty because uh, you, you can do this with many different species. And this also results in food, spe food tree species conservation because the trees are more valuable now uh, as food and fuel than they are uh, as fuel alone. And what, what this is is a move from, uh, is the first step away from monoculture or monocropping uh, into, in this case, a, a, your basic polyculture. If you used one species of tree and one species of crop, now you're growing two species on the same space instead of one. Uh, and ideally, this would result long-term in an increased polyculture or many species of different types of things growing on the same space, which uh, many would describe as permaculture. 
and so now I will define permaculture as Mollison defines it, which is permanent agriculture. And so what makes it permanent uh, is a reduction in inputs, notably petroleum, and a transition away from uh, short-term cropping to uh, more perennial types of crops and an increase in diversity of food product. <coughs> Next, I'd like to introduce uh, halophytes, and let me give you the definition of halophyte. is a salt-loving plant. And uh, for those of you that caught uh, Dr. Sato's mangrove uh, video, uh, then uh, you're, you're well aware of the uh, potential for halophytes, which do not need fresh water for irrigation. You can use seawater for irrigation. Um, and when you have halophytes growing intensively along the seashore, this re reduces salt infiltration into fresh uh, surface aquifer uh, because they're uptaking the salt water uh, into their tissues uh, rather than the salt water running into uh, surface aquifers. So uh, this would help greatly in areas where there's a limestone aquifer, places like Florida, uh, you know, could use these, these mangroves and use these uh, techniques, even though they're doing water mining or groundwater withdrawal, that it, this would still reduce the amount of salt water uh, intruding into the, these aquifers. Um, now, it isn't just mangroves, but there are several varieties of trees which can be used for this effect. Tamarix is one and native to uh, uh, Eurasia. And so, uh, instead of being limited to uh, 36 degrees north latitude to 36 degrees south latitude with our mangroves, uh, which now, again, Dr. Sato has made the scientific breakthrough necessary to grow these on any desert coast. Um, and we have an initial, um, between 50 degrees north latitude and south latitude, one million kilometers of coastline, approximately one million kilometers of coastline. Um, I've, I've removed uh, unsuitable urban areas, cliffs, and existing uh, uh, forest stand and mangrove frontage from this figure and basically just cut it in half for heuristic purposes, leaving us with 500,000 kilometers of usable coastline that can be planted in trees. Naturally, this would result in a gigantic difference in carbon uptake, result in all sorts of feedstocks, food production, uh, and, and uh, associated security here in UK you have a town called Samper well the Samper is uh, Salicornia Europea which is a very very tasty vegetable which does not require fresh water to be grown and also assists in storing carbon into uh, seashore areas and uh, the, so a halophyte polyculture system will have all of the associated benefits of agroforestry as well I haven't even mentioned timber yet but that's another wonderful thing products comes out of it. So let's talk about permaculture and say, well, if we're going to remove, uh, you know, a quarter of our arable surface area and put it into trees, how on earth will we eat? Well, the mechanical agriculture, the or standard agriculture as it's called, uh, generally produces about 0.2 to 0.5 per person acre of food. Now, uh, permaculture, your basic temperate permaculture or French intensive systems, uh, which is a hand labor uh, uh, inten uh, intensive direct agriculture system, is capable of producing five person acres of, of five persons per acre of food, rather than the 0.2 to 0.5 person acre that you have from standard agriculture. So obviously that alone is 20 times plus more efficient. Now, the Cubans had, uh, during their food crisis and separation during the collapse of the Soviet Union, had their own food crisis because they lost a lot of their imports and at the same time lost almost all of their exports. And so they had to jumpstart their entire agricultural system using high intensity urban agriculture. According to them, they are able to attain a number that is 25 person acres, 25 person acres of food per year. Uh, so this is now on order of hundreds to about a thousand times more efficient than standard tractor agriculture. Now permaculture also eliminates all biocides. No more chemical pesticides are ever used. Uh, so no more poison in it and an according result uh, of a lower, greatly lowered pollution. Um, and it, by its technique, it 
milled soil uh, up and, or soil banking rather than uh, the mechanical means of stripping it down to, as Mollison says, beat a yield out of the soil by continuous plowing. By shaping the land in the right way, it charges aquifers up, creating a lens of, of fresh water underneath the cropping area, uh, resulting in, in drastically reduced to eliminated um, irrigation, whereas the standard model mines out aquifers, sucking them dry, lowering wells to the point that they can no longer be used. And permaculture uh, supports a diversity uh, or polyculture, uh, or intentional diversification of crop on all areas, growing many crops on a given area, and noting their interactions by observation of nature, whether these crops potentiate or depotentiate each other, in order to understand whether you'll get a crop increase or decrease, and then growing those combinations of crops together to provide an increase. And because you're growing more than one crop, on the same area, if one of those crops fails for whatever reason, you at least have the other crops available for use. So this greatly increases food security uh, as opposed to monoculture, which is growing one crop. Um, and I guess the downside, which is that uh, uh, this concentrates on a, a large initial input of human labor, uh, in, uh, which is decreasing over time because you're relying on more perennial crops, perennial vegetables, and trees as your source of food rather than the continuous cropping uh, uh, involved in the standard method. Um, so we have human labor, labor being reduced over time as opposed to standard agriculture which uses carbon slaves uh, or tractors and which is you know dependent upon a carbon fuel source uh, which is increasing over time as you have to dig deeper into the soil and apply more um, petroleum-based fertilizers and such. So these, these uh, carbon slaves, rather than, than horse slaves, now we have carbon slaves. And, th and this results in an increasing demand for this carbon energy source over time. Any questions? <laughs> Yes. Ah, oh, okay. Hi, Donald. How much energy used in the pyrolysis process and what is the net benefit? Energy is actually created because it's an anoxic burn. Uh, it just takes enough energy to get it started, which can usually be done by uh, use starting with an oxygen burn in the chamber and then shutting off the oxygen once a uh, critical temperature has been reached. So actually, it uses, it's, you're producing more energy and once the uh, reaction begins, if you have a continuous feed mechanism, usually a screw type mechanism into the cylinder, uh, where you can continue to add fuel into the process and use this to, to uh, create steam, to create a, a steam power turbine, and of course, recollect the hot water for heating or whatever other use for hot water you have. And how does rising su uh, ocean surface temperature affect mangrove survival? Um, not very much because they are accustomed to growing in the shallows to begin with and also this is a moderated effect because the higher the temperature is the greater the rate of evaporation is off the surface of the ocean and the greater of a cooling effect will occur. Uh, they also cool themselves again by transpiration or sucking up more water in order to release it from their pores uh, simulating an in, uh, actually um, on this, uh, I would say that trees have had have mastered the art of modifying their local climate, which they had already mastered this technology before we were rodents. And so, one of the ways that they cool themselves is by releasing uh, water at a higher rate than is possible through evaporation. This is plant transpiration. So they're able to keep themselves cool in this way, it would, and uh, rising sur ocean surface temperature would not affect mangrove survival very much until, of course, some point after we're all dead and we've already killed off the atmosphere. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of, the, you know, we should grow the crops. I want to harvest the crops. Uh, and you talked, you mentioned uh, carbon slaves. But would you still need the carbon slaves, or some kind of slave, the horse slaves, or this is people say, but we, you, know, you would still need it to use energy to, to harvest the, the, the fruits of the, 
this in this way this is getting your standard farmer to take the bait as it were which is one again reducing the uh, by because they have tree rows in their in their alley cropping now it's reducing the amount of tractor work that is actually occurring uh, so even though they're still growing wheat at the beginning uh, they, they, they would be using the tractor a little bit less and when you combine this with on-farm biochar production if they produce all of the fuel from the cellulose from the wheat and the trees in order to fuel their tractor you have a net carbon negative cycle even if they keep using the tractor if you provide them with the right series of technologies in order to best take advantage of the new carbon economy that we inevitably or hopefully will institute that this actually has a net carbon negative they're taking more carbon out of the atmosphere by burning the fuel in the tractor and getting that fuel from their farm and this is also a way to get them to say oh well you know maybe there is a different way to do something and then they can be turned on to more uh, diversified agricultural practices Well, first of all, I, th I think that was a really lovely presentation. Um, and I think... Also, I thought that was a very enlightening presentation because I have to say I was a bit skeptical about, for example, biochar, which has been severely attacked by um, Gaia, maybe, for example. But, <coughs> sorry. Um, I, I just thought we should, in the light of Ben's presentation, we should certainly add Halophyte culture, polyculture, agroforestry, and permaculture to you know, work it into our manifesto mm -hmm. um, with Ben's help. And just one little question in the product in biochar, I saw that creosome is part of the process, and I understand that's a, a horrendous carcinogen and very dangerous. And I wonder if the process uh, takes care of that problem. All ethanes are carcinogens. Oh, All ethanes are carcinogens. Everything that comes out of a of petroleum is, is, is that it, that it is uh, volatile is a carcinogen. So all petroleum that we are currently using is carcinogens. Um, this would allow us to get away from it. It uses much of the same equipment as petroleum distillation. You're using fractal distillation, which is basically the same thing that's used on crude oil. You're just ra switching your, your feedstock away from uh, fossil fuel, which requires fossil fuel to, to procure and fossil fuel to transport. And so instead of doing this in gigantic industrial scale uh, fossil fuel uh, fractal distillations and refineries, instead you switch this to a much smaller scale. Naturally, not everything is going to be perfectly safe. You should use appropriate caution when handling these materials. Can I, just have one, can I just have one, it's just a point of information, uh, I think there's a book called The Sanctuary of Trees by Jean Logsdon which outlines some of these points, so it's, it's just to add to the reading list. Uh, 
and it's point zero. Yeah, yeah. And high intensity human managed nice agriculture. Uh, we have uh, again a factor of between 20 and 1,000 times the efficiency of food production that is done in standard agriculture. So when you come, when you when you if you make the assumption that all agriculture is carried out by tractor, then yes, you are going to have a problem. But if you make the assumption that a large majority of agriculture is going to be carried out on a small scale by human labor. There, then suddenly you have these gigantic leaps in efficiency which create much more food than would have been possible under the standard system. Okay, but you didn't answer the bit about which was that you would need to set out a dedicated... Like the specific um, point that he made was that there's not enough natural waste and you would need to set aside a dedicated spot. You need to grow crops for that. So are you saying... Unless I missed it, are you saying you wouldn't be able to do it from natural waste because the energy you need to be much less so you're saying you would need to set aside a spot of And this is why we introduced agroforestry, because those same, and especially agro-pastoralism, or um, you know, basically mixing animal and, and tree crops together, you get a free tree crop where you're growing these animals. It wouldn't need to be any additional area added just use existing ranch land that is being used for sheep or cattle at this present time. You get the same amount of sheep and cattle, in fact, you get more. Now he's talking about the waste, he's talking about the source for the biofuel. So he's saying, uh, would you, you'd have to, there wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to generate enough fuel using just the waste left over, you'd have to actually set aside ground to grow biofuel for it. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying. By yeah. this is mixed usage. You're now using the ground, the same area, for two processes rather than one. One of those processes is coppicing or creation of dedicated biofuel stocks. The other one is existing. Area.